Beyond, there is only horror. Hey, what's up, everybody? Subtract them here. This is my build guide for the Cast on Crit Forbidden Right Chaos Inoculation Occultist. Normally, this is the part of the video where I would do some sort of fancy editing and have a little fun intro with some dramatic music that really gets you hyped up. But if you clicked on this build guide, you probably already know this build slaps. This is even taking into account the amount of currency that it takes to get started, even at higher levels of investment the strongest build I have ever played in Path of Exile, almost the most damage I've ever done, and possibly the tankiest I have ever been, even including my very tank-focused build. You can do everything from 200% quant, height of hubris, uber pinnacle bosses, to going AFK at wave 25 plus in a simulacrum, going downstairs, getting a cup of coffee, and coming back, character still alive. It can literally do all the content in the game, and it is also an absolute joy to play. It's a cyclone cast on crit build. It's just really easy to hold down right click, watch your character fly forward, and explode the entire screen. Also, Cat MTX. Hard to go wrong with that. However, this is a slightly more complex build than even a normal cast on crit build. There's a lot of things that you can get wrong, and I have a feeling that there are a lot of people that are gravitating to this build just because it's so strong, especially in this league with the new Arch Nemesis modifiers and the Uber bosses. A lot of people want to play this build and it is very, very easy to not get it right. This is probably a lot of people's first times playing cast on crit. I'm going to do my absolute best to provide as much information as possible to introduce you to this style of play. Occultist, chaos damage, and cast on crit are kind of my bread and butter, and so this build is just perfect for me. This is going to be one of my densest and most comprehensive build guides ever, so definitely grab your cup of coffee, tuck in, and get ready because there's going to be a lot of information here. So without any more preamble, let's get into it. So as I alluded to at the beginning, this is the strongest build I've ever played. In terms of the balance of offense, defense, clear, able to take on all content in the game, I have really never played anything that's on this level. I am incredibly impressed at the power of this build, and it is taking advantage of a lot of stuff that's in the game right now that's kind of been building up for the past handful of leagues to the point where I usually hesitate to call that something is going to get nerfed, but this build is probably taking advantage of some things that I would not be surprised that GGG has in their sights. What even is the build in the first place? So we are using Cyclone with cast and critical strike support to trigger Forbidden Right, which is a chaos damage skill. We are an occultist, which allows us to get more AOE, more chaos damage, and more power charges to get more damage and critical strike chance through those power charges. For defense, the primary thing that we're doing is the combination of the Aegis Aurora unique champion shield that you've probably heard of. It is ridiculously strong. It keeps getting more and more popular, especially as the game gets more difficult. It is a very, very powerful defensive layer in combination with the Melding of the Flesh Unique Jewel, which allows us with the correct amount of investment to get 90 Fire, Cold, and Lightning Res across the board. In combination with that, we are also Chaos Inoculation, or CI, which means we take zero Chaos damage. We don't have to worry about Poison. We don't have to worry about Cirrus's Chaos Conversion. We don't have to worry about a lot of really, really annoying stuff in the game. Those little Toxic Balls that explode over your head with Arch Nemesis? Ignored. So on an absolute scale with how I would judge this build, this is not some IGN like inflated number type of thing. This is overall eight out of 10 damage for me. The entry level amount of damage of this build is between 10 and 15 million. And with some investment, you can get up to 40 or even 60 plus million DPS if you really want to push it. In terms of defense on an absolute scale, outside of very specific hardcore characters that you have to go as tanky as possible, I have never played a tankier character in the entire game. If there's a bunch of monsters attacking you, you can just go AFK, go get your coffee or your pizza or something, and uh, and come back and your character will be alive. There are some things that can sometimes sneak through. You can get unlucky. We are block-based, so you can get killed once in a while, but it's incredibly rare. You are just cycloning around. You can hit Withering Step and go really fast, especially when you get the Mage Blood and the higher investment. Everything feels really nice. There's nothing that like really drags you down. It's really, really good as a Simulacrum or Delirium Farmer. This is on the absolute scale of complexity on the more complex side. If we would put cast on crit builds in general, I would put it at about a 5 out of 10. Anything that's just kind of like self-cast without too many mechanics, I would put below 5 out of 10. 
I like to put cast on crit in general, you know, right in the middle. There's a lot of numbers you have to balance and a lot of breakpoints and all that. This is even a little bit more complex than your standard cast on crit build because not only are we balancing our cast on crit breakpoints, we're also thinking about our forbidden right breakpoints. And then later on, we are looking at the balance between our stats, our resistances, the mage blood and dealing with ailments and all that type of stuff. It, it is a little bit more complex. When people ask me how much it takes to get into this build, this is the problem, right? Is like the value is based on the popularity of the build. If I say 60 exalts, I put out this build guide, popularity goes up, that could become 80 or 100 after making this video. All I can tell you is about two to three weeks ago, it took me about 60 exalts to get to a point that I was comfortable. That's like basically the ceiling that you're going to hit until you buy the mage blood and then you can easily put one two three or more hundred exalts into the build after you get the mage blood but with all that said i put 60 exalts into this build i did wave 30 simulacrum i did all of the uber bosses build felt great for a second build that is able to take on all content in the game i think that that is a respectable amount of currency it is definitely not a walk in the park but it is an amount that i think most players should be able to farm especially how easy it is to get currency these days and then the third downside is that it is a, a melee-ish build. You know, we're able to just cyclone around. It's a lot better than playing a strike skill, of course. But it does have the downside of, you know, bosses teleporting around. Something like Uber Sirius can be particularly annoying because he has like a billion laser beams. That try to get onto him so you can actually do damage. Conversely, you know, with like a bow build where you're just shooting from across the screen, right? So it has that downside, but it's really minor and, you know, 99% of the time, everything's going to feel great. All right, so what to expect? This is not going to be a short video. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to be at time of me talking right now, but it's not going to be a short video. I'm going to be going into as much detail as humanly possible. There will be a crafting guide and a spreadsheet that will accompany this as a resource. I would recommend also looking at all of the previous videos that I have showed 20, 40, 60 exalts of investment all the way up until the mage blood and all of that. This is one of those builds that you just have to play for a good amount of time, really understand it. It is not a simple build. Don't just think that you're going to copy paste everything and everything's going to be hunky dory. Even with my knowledge and my experience, I've made multiple cast on crit builds, build guides and all that. Even then I had to consult with people and like really figure out a couple things because everything in this game is really complicated. I'm going to do my best to answer everything that I can here, but obviously I'll be missing things. And if there's something that I haven't answered, definitely let me know in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. And if it's a more complicated question, share POBs and all that, please join the discord and go to the build discussion channel and uh, we'll do our best to help you out. But yeah, this is a build where the longer you play it, the more time you put into it, the more patient you are and understand that it is a very good build. In my opinion, this is a 10 out of 10 build. I have never played anything stronger. The build is very good. There's nothing wrong with the build. <laughs> so if there is something wrong with how you are playing it, you know, look internally, ask questions, reflect, really, really study what you've done and take the time to figure out what might be missing so you can get it to, to be that 10 out of 10 for yourself. The format of this guide is going to be significantly different than build guides that I've done in the past. I'm going to be starting up front, actually, addressing some specific things that people have questions about before we get into the specific nitty gritty of talking about the gear and the gems and all of that, because this is a bit more of a complicated build. I want to talk about the mechanics specifically themselves first, so we can start getting that into your brain. And then we'll talk about how they fit together, you know, as we go into the actual game. This is a cast on crit build. If you've never played cast on crit before, if you don't understand it, very, very well. I made a guide about two weeks ago. This should answer any questions that you have specifically about cast on crit. It's basically the first more complex style or archetype of build that people generally play when it comes to Path of Exile. It requires you to both have attacks and spells and crit chance. And you're also balancing things like cooldown recovery rate and your attack speed. There are many ways to do cast on crit builds wrong. Once you get used to it and you've done it a couple times, it just kind of comes second nature. But until you get there, you know, you're probably going to run into a lot of pitfalls. It is dramatically more complex and more finicky than just a regular League Starter style build. The guide is in the description below. Please try to understand Cast on Crit very intimately before you try to take on this build. Because this build adds multiple layers of complexity to that. I just want to get that out of the way. But if you're comfortable with Cast on Crit, let's talk about Forbidden Right. So what is Forbidden Right? It is a chaos skill 
that shoots a projectile, which is a little purple ball, and it has a couple of very unique and interesting properties. First off, it's actually auto-targeting. So if you're self-casting for a bin right, it's just really, really good quality of life regardless, but we don't care about that since we're Cyclone anyway. And then the really unique characteristic of Forbidden Right, it does damage based on how much life and energy shield that you have. So a really cool thing is as you just stack more life and energy shield, your skill also just does more damage. So you can scale both your offense and defense very comfortably. However, there is a downside. Forbidden Right does damage also based on your life and energy shield. And it does it as chaos damage. So while you do more damage, it also does more damage to you as you're scaling it up. So how do we solve all that? It's doing chaos damage to us. So we just take chaos inoculation. This node makes us immune to chaos damage. Everything from poison to Kosas's chaos damage to our self damage with Forbidden Right are fully nullified. Also, every time that we cast Forbidden Right, we take a hit as secondary chaos damage. It can't be mitigated by things like block, but if we can't take chaos damage at all, we don't take that damage regardless. Our max life gets set to one, so we actually lose that scaling vector of the damage. So we're only getting the damage out of ES, and it's actually a lower percent than it is for life on Forbidden Right. CI gives us so much comfort that for me, that's really non-optional. Non and as you can see, we do more damage than we really need to anyway. The other big thing to understand about Forbidden Right is a maximum of five projectiles are needed for your maximum damage. POB will tell you that you can just keep adding more projectiles for more damage, but realistically, that's just not how it's gonna work. You're just going to be able to hit your single target with five projectiles. Any additional projectiles will help you clear, but it won't help your single target damage. The other key to know is that when you're casting Forbidden Right, it will shoot the primary projectile at the initial target, and then it will have additional projectiles. One of them will also hit that single target. All of those other additional projectiles that says fired at surrounding targets, those are not going to the primary target. They're going at the surrounding one. So the initial target actually starts with one plus one projectiles. That just means we have to get plus three more doing things like using Dying Sun, Volley Support, and the Forbidden Right Helmet Enchant. All can give us one additional projectile on the primary target. Remember, we're starting at two with the one plus one. Once we get to five projectiles on the primary target, then we don't want to go for any more, and then we want to be making sure that we're scaling our overall damage on the skill. That's why you're going to see things recommended like using Volley Support instead of Greater Volley Support, because going over five projectiles doesn't really do anything. And then the very nice thing about this is because there are so many different vectors that we're able to scale our damage, we can very easily get into the multiple tens of millions of DPS. Just getting more energy shield, more damage. We can go up to our five projectiles, which is a really nice multiplier. We can go for anything that says increased spell, chaos, or projectile damage because it is also a projectile. And since it's a cast on crit build, we are scaling our critical strike chance. We can scale our crit multi and really push our damage up through that multiplier as well. But as always, when you're scaling your damage in, in Path of Exile, use Path of Building. Open up your POB and figure out what is actually going to be scaling your damage the most. Just saying crit multi is more damage is not always true. All right, understanding the defenses of this build. There are many of them. <laughs> I, it's entirely possible that I even miss some. Since we are a CI build, we are Chaos Inoculation. All of our defense is coming from our energy shield. We only have one max life. <laughs> if we lose one life, we die. So our primary layers here are using block with Aegis Aurora and Melding of the Flesh. How does that work? When you block something in Path of Exile, you actually take zero damage by default. The default max block chance is 75%. So three out of four attacks, and if we have spell block, three out of four spells that come in as hits, only hits, uh, anything like a damage over time on the ground. Any hits from spells or attacks will be blocked. We'll take zero damage by default, and we're happy. Capping that 75%, especially as an occultist, not the easiest. So what we do is we actually use a large thread of hope that allows us to grab glancing blows, which makes us actually take 65% of the damage on a block, which is a significant downside, but we can very, very easily cap our block since it's doubling all of our block values. The big thing here is that allows us to cap spell block, which is actually gigantic for our defenses. That combined with the Aegis Aurora shield, so by capping our block and then using the Aegis Aurora champion shield, it says 2% of our armor, so we want a lot of armor, is replenished as energy shield when you block. So in the example of my character right now, I have 7,500 energy shield and I have 90,000 armor. Quick little calculator there. Every single time that we block, we get back 1,800 energy shield. This is the big reason why we can go like AFK in something like a simulacrum where there's a bunch of monsters hitting us. If a bunch of hits are coming in at like 500 damage post mitigation, that means that three out of four of those hits will be replenished as 1800 energy shield. So we're actually healing 
as we're taking hits. <laughs> and that's like the real important thing about using Aegis Aurora, capping your block and getting your energy shield and armor as high as possible. And that's like really the core defensive layer here. But wait, there's more. There's a good chance that you've heard about the melding of the flesh combo with Aegis Aurora. I would not be surprised if the five max cold res is deleted from the Aegis <laughs> in, the, in the next patch. What melding the flesh does is it says your max res of all your reses, cold, lightning, and fire are set to the highest with the most max res. So if we look at the Aegis Aurora, it gives us plus five max cold res. That means our max cold res is 80. If we equip the Melding of the Flesh, that will also set fire and lightning to 80. So all we have to do is scale our cold max res as high as possible. So we do that by using Purity of Ice, scaling non-curse aura effect, and getting the level of Purity of Ice as high as possible, and then finding all the other ways that we can hit the max cold res doing that with Eldritch Implicits on gloves, or even getting a little bit more on the passive tree. It is not that hard to get 90 max res on this build, and you can very, very quickly and easily hit it. At low investment, you can hit 85 all res, which already makes you significantly tankier against Fire, Cold, and Lightning res. The additional huge thing about scaling Fire, Cold, and Lightning res instead of just Spell Suppression or Spell Block is that it does help us with ground degens or any ailments that might be doing damage over time. As I said previously, we're also chaos immune, so you know, we can just ignore that. Uh, we also have elusive through withering step, which gives us about 22% hit avoidance when you first hit your withering step. Not to mention it makes you faster and everything feels better as well. In addition, you can see that I have 10% spell suppression at higher investment if you want to go for it, especially using recombinators. If you see this video after 318, I can't promise recombinators are still in the game, but as of time of recording, we can use recombinators to put spell suppression on any piece of gear, it doesn't have to be evasion based, which would allow us to basically cap our spell suppression and then we're very happy campers. <laughs> That's kind of like a, if I wanna upgrade my build even further from where I have it right now, I only have 10% spell suppression, I can recombinate that onto my gear and hit nearly 100% and get even tankier, but it's just not necessary. <laughs> um, and so like the, really the only defensive downside right now is damage over time. Since we are energy shield only based and we rely on ES gain on hit through a watcher's eye, that's like our main recovery in, in addition to the Aegis Aurora replenish, damage over time, especially dots on the ground, the chilling ground from the arch nemesis mods, uh, bleeds are really, really annoying. Those can be a pain in the butt if you haven't solved them. That is why I strongly recommend always keeping vault discipline instead of real discipline. It's a really good oh crap button, just heal yourself all the way up and then get out of danger. One of the biggest things to solve in a cast on crit build in general, and especially this one, because Forbidden Right does cost a lot of mana, is dealing with mana. In 3.15, they made it so almost all triggers in the game actually cost mana. And many times there's a more mana multiplier. Look at cast on damage taken. And there were people out there in the community saying that cast on crit is dead. It's not. Honestly, I found it kind of frustrating how many people were saying that. They just were used to how easy it was to deal with mana. This is just adding more complexity. This is adding another problem to solve. And the way that I view Path of Exile and builds specifically, builds are a build is just a problem to solve. The problem is how do I kill monsters? How do I get loot? How do I run around in my hideout? How do I solve that problem? They just added another layer to it to make it, honestly, in my opinion, more interesting. And in fact, there were some upsides to the mana cost where you can you know, do things based on, on spending mana. So the people that were decrying the death of uh, Cast on Crit, they just didn't know all of the tools that we had at our disposal. Now, it does require some investment into figuring out how to deal with it, but we have a lot of tools. There are basically two primary levels of investment of this build, kind of two and a half. There's like post-mage blood and then way post-mage blood, and you can just keep pushing it after that. But it's basically a step function where I kind of view it as your pre-mage blood, you gotta get all those pieces, put it fully together, you're good to go. And then once you get your mage blood, it allows you to solve a lot of problems and really simplify some things, but it also allows you to scale and add complexity and damage and defense and a lot of other ways, which is why we get the mage blood. So what do we have to deal with for mana cost? Cyclone itself will cost mana. Forbidden Rite will cost mana. Every single time that you trigger it, it will trigger its mana cost. And when we're fully put together, that's over 10 times a second which is a lot of mana. And then cast on damage taken, flame dash, whirling blaze, anything like that will also cost mana. And especially since we want to be reserving as many auras as possible, we don't want to use a mana flask. How do we deal with that? The simplest thing that I'm just going to say that you should start off with, Replica Conqueror's Efficiency. This is just the go-to for any build that has mana issues. In addition to that, 
There is the Elrion Veiled Prefix. If you unveil it, you can craft it yourself. It goes from minus six to minus seven, and then you can even use Fertile Catalyst to make that minus eight. With two of those, both at minus eight, you have a combination of minus 25 to your mana cost, just with the jewel and both ring crafts. That will then already be putting you into a very, very comfortable spot. Pre-Mage Blood, this is how complex it is. This is all the pieces that we have to keep putting together. Uh, we also want to anoint Essence Sap on our amulet, gives us mana leech. In addition to that, what really brings it all together is we want to use a Gemini Claw. 14 mana gained on hit, that will solve the remainder of our issues, and then we should be all done with mana. If you are in like a non-regen map, or if you're still like kind of uncomfortable, maybe, maybe it's a little tight, you're trying to squeeze in some more auras, you can also use an Enduring Mana Flask that doesn't cancel. And then the other thing that I would encourage you to do is double check your links. The mana cost of your skill is based on the multipliers from all of the support gems, right? So you get your base mana cost, and then every support gem is a multiplier, you know, 120%, 140%. Some are even 150%. Cast from damage taken is like 200% multiplier. It's very easy for your mana cost to kind of spiral out of control. Be very, very specific. Make sure that when you're putting this build together, all of the little pieces are lined up. You know, definitely double check your POB exactly against how mine is. Make sure that there's nothing that you're missing. Now, when we go into a post-mage blood world. So the key here is we want to change from the claw, which doesn't allow us to get any additional damage on the prefix. Claws are really set up for attacks, so there's no other damage prefixes on them that we can use. We want to change to a dagger, but a dagger doesn't have mana gained on hit. Specifically, we want to use an Imperial Skeen, which is a rune dagger, which gives us plus one to all chaos spell skill gems, which levels up our Forbidden Right, gives us more damage. And it also has spell damage as a natural prefix on it as well, which if you do get lucky and hit that, you can get even more damage. So by losing the Gemini Claw, we lose a lot of that mana gained on hit. So we have to solve that by what the Mage Blood gives us. The really, really big thing here is there is a Veiled Suffix Craft on a flask that you get by unveiling Cinder Swallow Urns. That craft is 25% reduced mana cost of skills. The way the Mage Blood works is your flasks are always active. You can use Enkindled Flask to make them even stronger. And so with an Enkindled Flask, you can actually get 48% reduced cost of your skills. In addition to that, we want to use the Boot Enchant that says 18% reduced mana cost of skills. When we've been hit recently, as I said earlier, Forbidden Right counts as a hit. So even if we're cycloning around, Forbidden Right hits us as well, we get that reduced mana cost. And with those things put together, I actually have zero mana cost on my Forbidden Right, which means that I don't need the anointment anymore, and I can switch from a claw to a dagger, and I can even drop the Replica Conqueror's efficiency. That's all through the power of the Mage Blood being able to give us an additional 48% reduced mana cost. I was actually using an anti-stun boot enchant before, so I didn't do that until after I switched to a mage blood. This is one of the most common questions when it comes to this build, switching over to a mage blood. People always ask, how do you deal with mana? These are all of the tools. You can mix and match them as well. It's not necessary to set that up exactly how I did, but just always double check, click on your forbidden right, look at what the mana cost is on it, and you know, mix and match these things to make it comfortable for you. Since we're a cast on crit build that has one life, and we're entirely energy shield based stuns. As I just said, I was using the 80% chance to avoid stuns if you've killed recently. Obviously doesn't help on bosses, but that alone already makes it so you're very, very rarely getting stunned. And then what you can do is use the harvest, add an implicit to a jewel craft, and then you can get 15% chance to avoid stuns. You get two of those, and then you have 100% stun avoidance and you're uh, immune to stuns. Hitting the jewel implicits is really, really annoying. You can get 15% across all your jewels, but there's so many different implicits. The chance of you just naturally getting, you know, 100% avoidance on your jewels is really, really low, even throughout the course of an entire league. So my recommendation is just go to the trade website, buy the jewels that already have the implicits, and then you can just throw them into Reforge Crit, Reforge Caster, anything like that. Craft up something decent and then just use it based on the implicit. Two 15% jewels, boot enchant, and if you've killed recently, you, have, you are 100% stun immune. I also recommend using Soul of the Brine King. You can only be stunned once every two seconds. Once you've solved stun, obviously that doesn't have too much value, but it does also give you freeze immunity and 50% reduced effect of chill on you. So just really, really good quality of life. I find it so hard to switch off of Brine King. I, I don't know the last time I used non-Brine King <laughs> as my primary. We're using Tempest Shield, actually, to cap our spell block, you know, Aegis Aurora, Glancing Blows, Tempest Shield, 
This will then also make us immune to shock. And since we are crit based, we actually get a little bit of a shock on our enemies, which makes us do more damage, which is really nice. I currently use the minor pantheon of Rolakesh for bleed, but you can also use Abrath for reduced uh, duration of ignite on you as well. Those are the two that I recommend for dealing with those. With all of that stuff for dealing with your ailments, and then you know, if you want to get ignite avoidance or chill avoidance or anything, I do recommend just going into the harvest jewels. We use a lot of jewels in this build. So you can use that in combination with your flask suffixes to really solve your, your ailment issues. Post Mage Blood, however, for stun, there is a stun avoidance craft at 50%. We actually get 97% stun avoidance from one enkindled stun avoidance flask. It's a Veiled Craft, the same thing, Cinder Swallow Urn. So you just need one 15% jewel in addition to that, and you are permanently stun immune. You can use the rest of your jewels for dealing with something like Ignite, which is what I'm going for. So yeah, that's how I recommend dealing with stun and ailments. These are the most common questions that I get day in and day out. I wanted to put these in the front of the video. I think these are gonna be like the most common things that you're gonna run into, the most common pitfalls and questions you're gonna have. The specifics of build, you know, most people just import the POB and try to copy paste it. We'll get into that now. All right, so you wanna be a hero. You wanna play cast on crit forbidden right. How do you get started? So the big thing here, one of the most common questions you're always gonna get is how do I level the build? The answer is this is not a league starter. This is not a build that you can level as. The answer is level as something that is good at leveling. That's really the way that I generally look at it. Very, very few builds outside of League Starters, because that's their purpose, are the ideal way to level as. My recommendation is look up things like Hollow Palm leveling, although I don't really love it on a Witch, or my real recommendation is use either Poisonous Concoction or Bane to level as an Occultist. It's not going to be the fastest or the best, but it'll be way better than try <laughs> trying to play this build from from early on. I have a Bane leveling guide if you want to see how to do that. Get up to at least level 90. This is a build that is very cluster jewel focused. We are, <laughs> it is very stretched along the top side of the tree and we have two large cluster jewel setups with four medium cluster jewels. What that means is a lot of the power of this build is stretched across the tree in a way where every single point is basically necessary to even make the build work. I really think the build just can't feel good before 90-ish. And then really every level after that is significant upgrades to the point where I would recommend planning on hitting level 100 if you really want to play this build. Even going from level 99 to 100 was a significant upgrade for this build, right? It, it's something where you just keep building up higher and higher and higher and the steps keep getting bigger because they're multiplying with each other. I recommend the Bandit Alira. You can go for the two passive points if you really, really want to, but the quality of life that you get from Alira with the mana regen, the crit multi, and the bonus resist. I'm just using Alira. I'm not going to switch off of it. So if you want to play this build, please understand cast on crit and forbidden right before you just try to YOLO put this thing together. So you have to learn to walk before you can run. You don't just go to the track and hop in a race car. You know, you spend 10 years driving your Toyota Camry, and then you can get into a race car. Please watch the cast on crit guide. You know, review the forbidden right mechanics. Self-cast it. Go to Blood Aqueducts. Self-cast it, look at what it feels like, look at the number of projectiles and try to understand those mechanics before trying to put this together. All right, and then the items that we want to go for. So first up, Skin of the Lords is really best in slot until high investment. Later on, we will be going for a global defense, Grasping Mail into Varagalia if you really want to go for the big upgrades. But I didn't do that until I, after I had a Mage Blood. This is my 50-ish Exalt recommendation. At this level that I'm going to be talking about right now, this is, I did Wave 30 Simulacrum. I did all the Uber bosses. This is very, very viable. You don't have to upgrade past this. Mage Blood is not necessary. These are the pieces that I used. So Skin of the Lords, why do we use that? 100% global defenses is really good. Since we are both armor and energy shield based and they feed into each other with the Aegis Aurora, anything that says increased global defenses is really, really good for our build. And Skin of the Lords gives us plus two to the level of all socketed gems, which helps us actually hit some nice breakpoints for cast on crit. And you can get really nice keystones like Unwavering Stance or Call to Arms or Divine Shield anything that is good for the build. There's actually a lot of keystones that are really, really good for the build that actually open up a lot of flexibility. A good amulet, you could do something like plus one all, plus one chaos gems with crit multi and all that. That's decent. But I actually really, really liked the internal struggle. That was a new amulet that was added to the mini pinnacle bosses that has random Eldritch implicits. And if you get it from the Black Star, gives you a 15% cull, which is actually an insane amount of damage on your character and gives you so much quality of life. I think a lot of people still underestimated how good that amulet is. 
<laughs> you can buy really good ones for like 10 to 50 chaos right now. Would strongly recommend that. I used it all the way until like a couple days after I got the mage blood. That is my number one recommendation. It's dirt cheap. You don't have to go for any expensive rare amulets. And I was still doing like 30 million DPS. Aegis Aurora is absolutely mandatory for this build. It is the core of our defenses. In addition to that, with the Melding of Flesh and Purity of Ice. All of these will go together. Thing I didn't mention is Melding of Flesh does give you minus 210 overall to all your res, minus 70 to all three resistances. Balancing your resistances is gonna be a pain in the butt. That's gonna be one of your big pain points as you're putting your gear together, as you're crafting your gloves and your rings especially, that's where you're gonna get most of your resist from. You're gonna want a level five Awakened Cast on Crit. You can get away with a level four with Skin of the Lords. Eventually we're gonna go for a level six, and you can get away with a level four, but we need to hit that 52% cooldown recovery rate breakpoint. So with the Awakened Cast on Crit and elevated CDR boots at 20%, you'll be able to hit that 52% breakpoint. As an alternative, you can use a Crusader or Shaper belt that will also give you another 15%, so you don't need elevated boots if you wanna get started. I primarily recommend a Despair on Hit ring. You can also go for a Corrupted Gloves that have Despair on Hit as an implicit there, but I really recommend just crafting your own gloves that have really, really good Eldritch implicits. I don't find the gloves like a really good direction to go. For the helmet, we're gonna want a Crown of the Inward Eye with the plus one Forbidden Right Projectile Enchant, right? The breakpoint that we wanna hit is those five projectiles for our primary target. The big goal there is to hit the plus one power charge implicit. I got incredibly lucky and we hit that on a single vol orb. <laughs> one helmet, one vol orb, we hit it on the first try. I believe the odds are about one in 250. So the chance that you're gonna hit that is like pretty low. What you can do is just put up a search for plus one power charge helmet and you can get it enchanted later. You can pay a lab runner, you know, look for reputable lab runner services out there and you can pay them to enchant it a little bit later. Then, as we said before with the mana, we want a Gemini Claw. The goals on the Gemini Claw are really, really good crit chance. That is critical. Um, <laughs> it is a cast on critical build, so we need to crit with our Cyclone. The crit chance of the Claw is the crit chance of our Cyclone. We wanna make that as high as possible. I aim for 8.5% or higher, which I think is like tier two crit chance. In addition to that, you want crit multi and then attack speed. Aiming for that 10.1 attack speed breakpoint. The primary way you're gonna start crafting this is with an essence of woe, which will allow you to get spell damage on the prefix and then finish the suffixes later. And there'll be a lot of crafting instructions, specifically how I did this stuff. There's gonna be a lot, there's a lot of different ways that you can craft many, many of these items but I will show the way that I would recommend doing it in the spreadsheet in the description below. We also want a large threat of hope. This will allow us to grab both Glancing Blows and Divine Shield. An alternative, if you're lucky, you can get a Skin of Lords that has Glancing Blows that opens up you know, a lot more skill points for you. You can do some fun stuff with that. That's a thing that I did for a little bit, but this is at higher investment especially. This is how we get Glancing Blows and cap our block and spell block. Not to mention that Divine Shield is also an incredible defensive layer that I guess I missed. Yeah, there's that, there's that many. <laughs> also, we're going to want a Militant Faith that is dominated by Dominus. It gives us damage based on our power charges. Since we are a power charge stacking occultist, it's a ton of damage. We're also going to want three passive Chaos Damage and Spell Damage Large Cluster Jewels. The Chaos Damage one that I have, I think it's basically perfect. And the spell damage one, I think there's a couple things you could play around with, but the one that I have is, is the combination that I actually prefer and what I would recommend. The last thing that I think is absolutely mandatory to make this build feel comfortable and good is an ES gained on hit Watcher's Eye while affected by Discipline. The one that I have is really nice. It also gives me flash charges while affected by Precision when I deal a critical strike. That is not absolutely necessary. You can very, very much play the game without that. The necessary one that I, I really think the build would be basically unplayable without is the ES gained on hit while affected by discipline. And the estimated cost for all of this, somewhere in the 50 exalt range. I hate talking about specific prices, right? It's all based on demand, right? If everyone wants to make this build, it could cost 500 exalts for one of these items. It's a small economy, it's a small community, it's a small game. Popular builds just necessarily, you know, if there's 10 of an item out there and it's going for 10 chaos, but a build guide goes out and, and, and I say, hey, buy this 10C item. And, you know, 100 people want the 10 items that exist. Price goes up, right? Um, that's just the nature of the economy in this game. All I can say is I spent about 50 exalts to get here and put all of this stuff together. And it felt awesome. If you did this a few weeks ago, it also would have cost you 50 exalts. Probably will cost more now. But even if it cost 100x to put this all together, I still think it would be worth it. This build is... It is that strong. All right, we're gonna go to my 50 to 60 exalt POB 
basically where my build was right before I bought a Mage Blood and started that whole process. This is my recommendation for really putting the build together. Now, there are steps before that. You can definitely watch my 20 and 40 exalt, you know, build diaries to see exactly what it would look like at that. But roughly the 50 to 60 exalt range, you know, and remember all of these prices are super dynamic. That's just how much I spent. That range is when the build felt awesome. I did Wave 30 Simulacrum, fully deathless. I did all of the uber bosses. I could do basically everything in the game. Very, very good strength. It was good enough to just say, this build's amazing. Even if Mage Blood didn't exist in this game, this build would still be very, very amazing. And I would still play it pre-Mage Blood. So I don't have this exact gear anymore. I don't have this exact setup anymore because I've already upgraded. So we're just gonna go over the POB really, really quickly to you know show what I've done here. As you can see, I have 87 all res. I'm not out, I'm not yet up to 90. I do have my block chance cap. I have 51,000 armor. I only have 5,300 energy shield, but that was actually enough. I felt pretty tanky anyway. Having that really good armor and that really good energy shield, having that really good armor and that really good max res with max block, I already was feeling much tankier than uh, a normal build <laughs> that I would play. So just to go over the gear really quickly, this is a Gemini Claw. I bought it with fractured critical strike chance for like 20 chaos. Who knows what it's going for right now. You can see we have that 14 mana gained on hit for each enemy hit by attacks. So as we're cycloning through a pack of monsters, that's just 14 mana and every single anim enemy that you're hitting, you just get your full mana sustained basically just from the Gemini Claw. All of the other tricks are basically just for, for single target. Aegis Aurora must have. Crown of the Inward Eye. I did have the plus one max power charges. As I said, I got that really early. I got very lucky. But you could just go for a regular Crown of the Inward Eye with the Enchant. That's that's good enough. For an alternative, you can go for a Crusader, Hunter, Hubris Circlet. This will give you more energy shield, but you don't get any armor. And then you can get plus one power charge. That way you can get plus one power charge and nearby enemies have minus nine or minus 12 if you elevate it. Chaos Resistance. It's not quite as good as the Crown, which gives us a lot of energy shield. It's really hard to beat the crown, but a very well-made rare can can eclipse it uh, until you get the plus one power charges on the crown. And then it's basically just best in slot. I was using a skin of the Lords that had Leaf Shade. Leaf Shade is really, really good for dealing with damage over time. It says take 50% less damage over time if you started taking it in the past second, but ailments last twice as long on you. So you do have to be, you know, ignites especially or bleeds can be a pain in the butt. However, with all of the pools on the ground, it, it does work for damage over time on the ground, shapers, beams, stuff like that. Within the last second, you'll take 50% less damage, so it's, a, it's an absolute lifesaver, literally. As I said before, alternatives would be like Glancing Blows, Divine Shield, Call to Arms. There's a lot of really good ones on the tree. The gloves, I just crafted these myself. These are just to try to get as much energy shield and resist as possible because we're using melting of the flesh. As I said, resists are really hard to get. I had the wither effect and expire slower right there, but I would recommend actually just going for spell suppression. We sustain max wither stacks with this build for free. So I wouldn't even worry about that. And then I was using the attack speed on the implicit. These are Eldritch implicits that you can get with the Eldritch Ichors and Embers. I went for the attack speed to try to hit, you know, get as close to my 10.1 trigger rate as possible. What you really want to go for is that plus two max cold res so you can you can get your, your max all res up. These boots, I got these really, really cheap and easy. I was actually crafting my own boots and I hit elevated tailwind on my first try. Someone listed these boots for 12 exalts and no, this is all. If you play a build and you start early, and you start putting together right away, and you're just looking for the deals within the first couple weeks of a league, you can get things much, much cheaper, right? So double elevated stuff at the beginning of the league was just much cheaper. Orbs of Dominance at the beginning are like 50 chaos. Now they're like two to 2.5 exalts. And that's just the difference of when you put a build together. It will always, always, always be cheaper to do it in the first you know, two to three weeks of a league. Once you're like six plus weeks into the league, everything just costs more. And that's just the nature of the game. So preference here is Hunter Crusader. We want Tailwind and we want ideally the Crusader elevated cooldown recovery rate. That 20% makes it a lot easier for us to hit the 52% breakpoint for our 10.1 attacks per second. Crafting instructions will be in the spreadsheet below. These are basically best in slot. I was also using the Veiled Prefix to get Onslaught on kill here. Preference later on would be to get the 30% movement speed immune to chill because uh, we can get Onslaught in other ways and the 12% Movement speed if you haven't been hit recently because of the way that Forbidden Right works for always being hit, unfortunately, isn't the best, which is what I have on my character. Eternal Struggle. I got really lucky. This dropped from the Black Star for me, so this was free for me. 
You can see I have 45% increased damage from my build on the implicits, and you can see there's a lot of really, really good ones. Gives us a ton of stats, and with Catalyst, we can get 18% increased global defenses, both energy shield and armor, and a 15% cull if it comes from the Black Star and Searing Exarch is dominant. So yes, you can technically get some more damage or quality of life maybe with a rare amulet, uh, Ashes of the Stars is the one we want later on, but you know, it's 40, 50 X. This is really hard to replace. I would not use a rare amulet over this, honestly. That much stats as well, um, really made ignoring strength and dexterity, especially very easy for this build. Since we're armor based, we want a high level determination and molten shell. So getting as much strength as we need on this build is actually kind of hard and uh, eternal struggle goes a long way. For the rings here, you can see I actually had Arcane Surge as a synth base. I got this from Ritual, actually. Not necessary. You can get the Arcane Surge from a Cluster Jewel, which we will be getting later. But this was a really nice quality of life early on. You can see it's just stats, just resist, and that non-channeling mana skills right there. And then this is my Despair on Hit, which is also just stats, energy shield, resist, and uh, yeah, the Despair on Hit as a Hunter Ring. Then the belt, I just crafted this. You know, I think I was just hitting it with resist essences. As I said before, melding the flesh resists are the hardest thing to get in the build. So just try to get as much res as possible, as much energy shield as possible. Later on, obviously, mage blood, but this was basically best in slot for my build, allowed me to cap out my res, be very comfortable. If you don't have elevated cooldown recovery rate on your boots, you can go for a Crusader or Shaper belt that can give you 15% cooldown recovery rate. You could even go for the tier two, like 10% if you wanted to. That'll put you over the 52% breakpoint. As always, have, a, have an anti-corrupted blood jewel, just uh, necessary for the build in my opinion. And then for the flasks, you wanna go for the flagellant prefix on the flasks. I've heard people saying flagellant wrong recently. It's flagellant, not flagellant. You wanna go for the flagellant or I guess sinner as well. I guess like penitent uh, is, the, is the theme here. Uh, you want to go for that. Oh, there we go. Even delinquent. That's the low tier. So flagellant is the is the number one tier. That's seven charges, then apparently <laughs> sinner, and then delinquent for the lower tiers. But what that says, we're not evasion based, right? We take all the hits. We take the hits. You know, we're we're flagellating ourselves. You know, <laughs> we take all those hits, and every time that we're hit, we gain those flash charges. And so this just gives us free flash charge sustain. As long as you're not, you know, avoid and evasion based. This is the best prefix on your flask in general. Gives you really, really good flask sustain and even helps you flask sustain through single target boss fights. I went for spell damage, leeches, energy shield, immune to bleeding, enduring mana flask, just made my mana for free. I went for critical strike chance on a basalt flask and a quicksilver flask with more movement speed. And this was good enough for me for now. Then if we look at the tree, I guess I already had Arcane Surge here. Arcane Heroism gives us increased effective Arcane Surge, and we get it when we hit a unique enemy, so it works on boss fights. Mage Hunter allows us to cap our spell block and gives us some more damage. Not to mention, we also get power charges on block if we want that. Then we just want medium cluster jewels, eye-to-eye -eye shrieking bolts, eye-to-eye -eye repeater. Um, I didn't go for two repeaters because that would have put me over the 10.1 breakpoint, but if you are under that breakpoint, you can go for two eye-to-eye -eye repeaters. Eye to eye is absolutely ridiculous. As you can see, it gives us 60% increased projectile damage against nearby enemies. It is one of the strongest nodes in the game, you know, especially for a cast on crit build that's using projectiles. So yeah, eye to eye is, is absolutely necessary. Shrieking Bolts is also really nice. Taunting is really good. And then my other jewels are just energy shield resist. Nothing fancy or special here. Replica conquers efficiency, minus mana cost. Pressure points, quick getaway. Pressure points, basics of pain. The thing that you're looking for is pressure points. You know, we get that double damage and crit chance and something else. The thing you're always going to be monitoring is what is your crit chance on your cyclone, your crit chance on your forbidden right, and then what's your attack speed, right? So I only have one quick getaway. If I had another quick getaway, I would have been over the breakpoint. So instead of that, I actually am using basics of pain. Just give me some damage instead. For the large cluster jewel, unwaveringly evil, unholy grace, and then dark ideation is the one in the back that we don't go for. There are alternatives. I think you can get something besides dark ideation as the third one. You'd have to double check. But uh, unholy grace and unwaveringly evil are really just like the best two for our build. Uh, Wicked Paul is also okay. The chaos interruption from stun thing. We're not using a chaos skill. We're using cyclone, which is not chaos. So this doesn't help us with stun at all. And then the Watcher's Eye, as I said, the necessary thing is that ES gained on hit while affected by discipline. And then Flash Charge will deal while Critical Strike while affected by precision. Really good. I have built around it, but not necessary. Melding of the Flesh at Perfectly Divine, that would be minus 70 to all of your res. But Elemental Res is capped by your highest of your max. 
Since my cold res max is 87 because of purity of the flesh, Aegis Aurora, all three of them are at 87. But, you know, you saw that I went for a lot of res across all of my gear because that was, you know, it's really, really hard to cap it up outside of that. And then, as I said, this large threat of hope gives us glancing blows, which allows us to cap our block, but we do take 65% of damage. And then Divine Shield, which 3% uh, of physical damage prevented from hits recently is regenerated as energy shield per second. This can stack up really, really quickly. And then the Militant Faith, we want to make sure it says converted by High Templar Dominus. And then the two things that we're going to be looking for are reduced mana cost of skills. And where it says minions right there, we want it to say non-curse or effect. So this was a very cheap one that I got for like 10, 20 chaos early on. Uh, later on, we want that non-curse or effect. Uh, and then we want that converted by Dominus. And this is why we go for it. Inner Conviction, 3% more spell damage per power charge. I currently have eight power charges. So that is just a 24% more damage multiplier for three passive points that's, that's worth on its own. And then if we also get that non-curse or effect and reduce mana cost, with all of these nodes that gets converted with the devotion here, it's really, really, really good for this build. Hopefully the rest of this tree, like there isn't too much else from the tree to really explain because as you can see, it's very cluster jewel focused. We just get chaos damage. Uh, cool thing about the chaos mastery is it says lose 10% of life and energy shield when you use a chaos skill. We don't use chaos skills. We are using cyclone. We don't have to care about the downside here. Everything else is just capping our block going for crit damage, non-curse aura effect, and mana reservation because we want to stack as many auras as possible and the strongest auras that we can. So you can see we're at 12.4 million DPS. It's not like the big number that I have right now, but it was enough. Wave 30 Simulacrum was very, very comfortable. All of the Uber bosses, you know, Uber Uber Elder was uncomfortable, but the rest of them were all, were all pretty doable. Just really high quality life, good fun to play build. I would still play it at this level again. And in fact, I did take it from here a little bit further. You can do that by getting more crit damage jewels, crit multi, spell damage, stuff like that. But I felt really, really comfortable like this and I was really happy at this level. Couple utility things I will note before we move on. A low level cast from damage taken with ball lightning and purifying flame, specifically divergent purifying flame. Since we have ES gained on hit from our watcher's eye, the ball lightning will hit a lot of monsters as it's sent out, cast from damage taken. That will give us a lot of ES gained on hit. And then divergent purifying flame does apply a more damage taken modifier to the enemies in that uh, in the consecrated ground there. This was pretty good quality life, but this setup does change post mage blood, post ashes of the stars. This was just a temporary setup until later, but it felt really, really comfortable when I was playing it. All right, you still with me? <laughs> that was the entry POB. That's as far as I took it. 60-ish exalts, felt really good, does all the content in the game. You do not need to upgrade after that, but if you want to, if you really want to take this build, to the point where it's just the best build I've ever played. Yeah, this is it. The dirty word in the room, you know, the one that people shy away from, that they're not happy with. But of all the leagues in the game, to get one, this is the league. With the Apothecary card added to the game, dropping in Crimson Temple, lots of people farming it. The price of a Mage Blood is significantly less than it was last league. Basically, the previous POB, the one that we reviewed, that's like kind of the ceiling that you can take the build until you get a Mage Blood primarily because we are relying on getting so much resistance from all of our gear. We don't have that much flexibility because we're building around melting the flesh. If you don't care about your defenses as much, if you don't really care about being that tanky, you can drop melting of the flesh and significantly push your damage up pre-mage blood. Replace all of your resistances with crit multi, increased damage. You could probably easily hit 30 million DPS pre-mage blood if you drop the melting of the flesh. Why and how do we use the Mage Blood? So first off, it solves resists with one flask. Why is that? We are able to use enkindled flasks. We use a bismuth flask with increased resistances on the suffix. So because we can roll 95% increased effect on a flask with getting the 75% base resistance from a single flask that is always active, 146.25 to, <laughs> to the all res, right? That hard solves the issue of resistances on gear and the downside of the melting of the flesh, that one flask. It also allows us to solve mana, which lets us switch over to a rune dagger, which lets us get significantly more damage on our character. And then since we have four flasks that are always active that don't need charges, we can rely on having a unique flask that's up most of the time. The charges are no longer shared between the flasks. That one flask will just basically have nearly 100% uptime, especially with a dying sun that is well rolled. Because of that, we can drop Volley, put in Awakened Void Manipulation, gives us significantly more damage on our character. Also, we can get 97% stun avoidance, as I said before. 
through the stun avoid suffix on the flask, just get one implicit on one of our jewels, and then we're done with stun. And then we can, you know, have a lot more open suffixes and, and open implicits on our jewels to solve other ailments. Because the flasks are so strong, right, we get that 195% effect of the flasks. That means that we can get a ton of armor and a ton of movement speed that is permanent. It's not even just temporary or relying on pressing your flask button. You will just always have that stuff. You go up to a 90,000 armor. You have 140% movement speed all the time. It just feels really, really good. What does this allow us to do? So all that gear that we were trying really, really hard to get as much resist as possible, now we can go th for things like crit multi, attack speed, chaos damage, stuff like that. It really opens up the ability to get a lot more damage on our, on our build. And then it also allows us to switch into the Ashes of the Stars. I was using the Eternal Struggle, but even if you were using a rare amulet, you would want stats and res on that amulet. Ashes of the Stars is incredible, right? But it has very, very little stats and no resist. So that is a slot that is filled up by Unique that's just not contributing to that. And with the Mage Blood and the consequences of the Mage Blood, now we can switch in Ashes of the Stars, which then allows us to also upgrade our body armor. When you upgrade to the Mage Blood, it's this cascading effect of, yeah, you're good. Like you can just buy a Mage Blood, fix your flask, and go. But the big thing that it allows you to do is get damage on your suffixes, get a new amulet, get a new body armor, and push your damage and your quality of life and everything into the stratosphere. By getting the Ashes of the Stars, you know, consequence, consequence we are now getting plus 30% quality on all of our active gems. We're now gonna have 50% quality on all of our gems. Now we wanna be looking at alternate quality gems. This allows us to replace a cast one damage taken setup that we were relying on before with a vengeance setup. Vengeance is a counterattack that triggers when you take a hit. And since you know we are taking hit every time we do forbidden right, then vengeance will trigger. The problem is using Vengeance before Ash of the Stars, it just doesn't trigger very often because it relies on quality for more trigger rate. And Ash of the Stars pushes that into the point where it's very, very comfortable. So we can switch Cast from Damage Taken to Vengeance. We can use Culling Strike and Purifying Flame to use Vengeance to trigger that increased damage taken. We go for alternate quality gems like Assassin's Mark and the Purifying Flame and Withering Step. This gives us max wither stacks for free, a lot of increased damage taken from the alternate quality gems. It's really hard to overstate how, how strong and how good the quality life is there. And then this allows us to go for a global defenses grasping male. You can use Recombinator to put on a Val Regalia if you want to, if you're like big boy. As I said before, we want that 100% global defenses. It's expensive, right? Replacing that skin of lords, very, very expensive, but it also has inherent armor, inherent energy shield, something skin of the lords doesn't have. And since it's just a rare body armor, we can go for non-curse aura effect and discipline aura effect as implicits with the Eldritch currency, which allows us to more easily upgrade our purity of ice, get closer to 90 all cold res, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have Ash of the Stars, we also get more mana reservation efficiency. We can then anoint charisma on our amulet, and then we can buy a second level four light. And yes, this becomes very pricey. <laughs> Basically, the way you want to think about it is spend about 60 exalts, have a good build. Happy. Ooh, everything is good. Feels good. Buy a Mage Blood. 170, 180x at the time of recording. Okay, build feels cool. I fixed my flask. Everything is clean. Everything's fast. I'm happy. And then, boom, 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 boom. New Dagger. Ashes of the Stars. Uh, global Defenses Grasping Mail. Buy a second level for Enlighten. Oh my god, I'm spending so much currency. But you spend another 100 to 200 exalts after the Mage Blood, and even with that much spent, even by spending 300 to 500 exalts, for, like relative to the amount of money spent, this is still the strongest build I've ever played. Even taking that into account, I don't think I can state how strong this build is, right? Like I have played very expensive bow builds that you know I spent a, a few hundred exalts on that were, that's really the like 80 million DPS, blah, blah, blah. In terms of the balance of offense, defense, quality, life, speed, Nothing I have ever played in this game compares to that. This is worth it, but you don't have to do that, right? That's why this says strong enough. You can stop here. You can do all the content in the game. You can get your 40 out of 40. This is the consequence of, all right, I want to farm up something bigger and to get bigger. You can have a nine out of 10 build here. Just, I want to make that very clear. This is the bonus. <laughs> all right. So then we can add in zealotry. Not, not just regular zealotry, uh, alternative quality is Eltry, which also works with Astra Stars, which also makes us do more damage. I go from 30 to 40 million DPS just by adding in Zealotry. 
So, you know, obviously it's worth it. The big boy POB. We'll quickly go over the POB here, but since this is my actual character in the game, I'll, I'm gonna mostly review it in game. So yeah, as you can see, I'm at 41.4 million DPS and counting the culling strike, it actually counts as 46 million DPS. The tree you can see actually looks exactly the same. Uh, the only difference, right, is I leveled up to 100. I think the previous one was like 97, 98. This allowed me to grab Throat Seeker here, and that's it. Otherwise, the tree is identical. Nothing changed here. It is just gear and gems. So in terms of the gear, I went for a fractured plus one level of all chaos spell skill gems, Imperial Skeen. We want an Imperial Skeen because it gives us the 1.5 base attacks per second, has a nice implicit. You can also go for a synthesized one, which... Uh, spells have a 10% chance to deal double damage, just 10% more damage. That costs more than I was willing to spend. I was able to buy this fractured base for very, very cheap. Other thing you can do is use a recombinator, at least at time of recording, and try to transfer any of these modifiers on to an Imperial Scheme, right? So look for any rune dagger that has plus one chaos spell skill gems, increased spell damage, attack speed, crit chance, crit multi, any of those modifiers. And then you can just use a recombinator, try to put it onto a good Imperial Skeen base. So buy the cheaper one, try to transfer it, and then you can craft up from there. Based on what you have fractured, there are so many different ways that you can craft this. This is actually a really fun, interesting, and easy craft because there are a lot of essences that allow you to start from a different base. My Aegis Aurora, if you saw the, the previous video, uh, we, we went for a lot of double corrupting of these. I got 8% Fizz from hits, taking his extra fire damage. They're actually pretty cheap at time of recording. They're down to like 50 chaos per. And you can just, you know, at, oh, at only about an exalt per uh, an attempt, you can go for double corrupting Aegis Auroras. And you can go for something really good like Fizz's Chaos. We're immune to chaos. Really, really good. Plus two socketed AoE or Aura Gems. Really level up our gem levels. Uh, this is one of the easiest targets to double corrupt on the build. Uh, exact same helmet, best in slot. And then as you can see here, I went for a Grasping Mail. I hit it with two tailoring orbs. Uh, this is an absolutely not necessary. I got really lucky, hit it with a second tailoring orb. That's how I got the defense modifiers increased effect. That's from the tailoring orb. Currently, they're very, very expensive, but at the beginning of the league, they're very cheap, which is when I would recommend buying them. And then the rest of the way that I crafted it, you can really choose whatever you want. You know, you want that fractured global defenses. You don't have to, you can just buy Anything that has any global defenses, try to fracture it later and just use something. I start off by crafting it with deafening essences of loathing. We want to have that increased mana reservation efficiency of skills so we can sneak in zealotry. I just did that until I hit strength and dex. Suffixes can't be changed, reforge defense, and I just want to get as much armor and energy shield as possible. Not to mention, I actually get enough evasion on my character for 20% evade. Uh, that was a nice little bonus. Exact same boots as before. Didn't change the boots besides getting the reduced mana cost of skills. If you've been hit recently, as I said, Forbidden Right always counts as being hit recently, so that should always be active when you're playing. And then we upgraded to Ashes of the Stars with uh, Charisma. This gives us a lot more mana reservation efficiency. Zealotry, 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 that's the goal. I bought an Onslaught on Hit Ring. I think I got this for 25x. The price has gone up since I bought it. This gives us Onslaught all the time. My attack speed is balanced around having Onslaught. You wanna make sure that this is checked and that attack rate is at 10.1 or lower. So this is with Onslaught active, I'm at 10.1. If you're a big, big boy, you can spend you know 75X on a power charge ring. I really find that unnecessary. I'm doing more damage than any human being needs to do, <laughs> but that's just the way that I play this game. I like the quality of life of just always having Onslaught no matter what. You'll see people doing Onslaught in their Vengeance setup that I mentioned before. I found it very, very unreliable. It was not up very often while I was mapping. Basically due to the AoE of Cyclone and the AoE of Vengeance, I, I just didn't find it reliable while I was mapping. And with something like Onslaught, you know, I like that consistency of my movement and attack speed. I really prefer an Onslaught on Hit Ring over Power Charge Ring, but that's my preference. So, and then I just crafted this with Crit Multi Essences, spammed it until I hit that, everything that you see there. Crafted non-channeling skills. I also have Fertile Catalyst, so it's minus eight mana cost. Uh, this ring was really, really fun to craft. Crafted this with de with Deafening Essences of Scorn. I had two Hunter Unset rings, and I had one with, definite, with the Deafening Essence of Scorn Chaos Damage, and the other one with the Despair on Hit that I was buying for like 30 Chaos. And then I just re used a Recombinator and recombined them until I had Chaos Damage with Despair on Hit. I got very lucky on the Intelligence Recombine, and then I did suffixes can't be changed, reforged defense, and I got uh, energy shield and evasion. And then I just crafted the non-channeling. 
Mage Blood, you do want the Wither Enchant later. You can get that from the, I believe, Dedication to the Goddess. The special upgraded offering you can go to Dedication, and that will give you Belt Enchants. All right, and let's just go to the game. I'm sick of looking at POB. <laughs> and then most important thing when you switch to a Mage Blood, of course, is your Flasks. What I'm doing here is this mana reduced mana cost of skills during Flask Effect. As you can see, uh, I'm actually at 1.94 instead of 1.95. This reduces the mana cost of my skill significantly, right? If we look at my Forbidden Right, it's at 10 mana. If I drop this, it goes up to 35 mana. This flask alone. And then if I've been hit recently with this Boot Enchant, an additional 18% sets my Forbidden Right cost to zero. Mana is solved. I don't have to worry about mana at all anymore. To demonstrate the power of the flask, you know, all of these, we want to go for the prefix that says increased effect. We actually don't care about the tier because we don't care about the duration. Uh, we just want to roll for increased effect and then the suffix that we're aiming for. And then you use enkindling orbs. And this can be really annoying. It can, it, it can take a few dozen to hit like a high percent. You want to use enkindling orbs to hit as close to 70% increased effect as possible. Gains no charges. We don't care about charges, right? We just always get the effect. And so enkindling orb, try to go for 70% effect. And then any prefix that you want to aim for that has increased effect. And then you can just, you know, a null and aug until you get the suffix that you're going for. This is a perfect flask. Bismuth flask was 70% effect and of the rainbow with dabblers on here. So if you look at my resists, I'm way, I'm like nicely overcapped. I'm comfortable. Everything's looking good. That's how strong it is, right? This alone gives me 146 all res. It's just that strong. And that's the power of the mage blood, which obviously now I don't have to worry about res anywhere else in my gear, basically. You know, a couple places I got a little bit of res. It just makes it so much more comfortable. You know, with the Granite Flask here, you can see, as I mentioned, Stun Avoidance 133 goes down to 136. You get 97% Stun Avoidance from the Flask alone. So you only need like one of those Jewel Implicits to, to be fully Stun Avoidance. And then uh, I have a Diamond Flask here with the increased armor on the suffix. You know, probably the easiest thing would be to put that on the Granite Flask just to like mentally have that set up properly. But it doesn't matter where the suffix is because it, it's just global. It doesn't, it's not on the Flask itself. So yeah, you can see my crit chance here without my power charges, 79%. If I take off the Diamond Flask, 58%, right? Because I'm getting a 195% increased global crit strike chance from this flask alone, the 25 plus the 70. That's just, that's how strong it is. And then I'm using a Dying Sun, used when charges reach full. I rolled it as well as I could. It's not perfectly rolled. So it lasts as long as possible and uses fewer charges. Used when charges reach full, that means I never have to press a single flask button. It's all automatic. And then since I have the precision when I crit, I'm getting flash charges as I'm critting all the time. I can basically keep full Dying Sun uptime even when I'm fighting a boss. And so since I can have full Dying Sun upgrade, I replaced my volley with Awakened Void Manipulation. Just gives me a lot more damage. And then in terms of utility, last up, we have the Vengeance setup that I was mentioning earlier. You may see people using it with Onslaught. I tested it a lot. I found it very unreliable. It was up best case 30 to 50% of the time when I was mapping and I, you know, I like my 100% reliability. So I just really didn't like that. And by replacing that Onslaught gem, I was able to put Culling Strike in here as well, which was just really, really nice for the quality of life. And then we have the Divergent Purifying Flame, 12% increased damage taken because of the Ashes of the Stars. And that's all linked with Awakened Cast and Crit. So Vengeance will be triggering roughly every 0.7 seconds and it will be periodically critting and triggering Purifying Flame uh, and Culling Strike when it hits as well. Just really, really nice quality of life. I found the Onslaught setup didn't really work very well for me, so I went for a Onslaught on Hit Ring. And then last up is on the gloves. You want to go for the Max Cold Res on the Implicit. I actually really, really like these gloves. You'll see other people with Hands of the High Templar to cap out their crit chance and getting Despair on Hit there. That allows them to use their two Power Charge Rings. That's why they use Onslaught here. I really find that much more of a POB Warrior style setup. I don't really prefer that. I'm all about that quality of life. Uh, Sorcerer Gloves would have been better than Fingerless Silk here, actually, <laughs> because they have a little bit more energy shield. I really like the quality of life by being able to go for much more energy shield than Hands of the High Templar, more resists. I can get my attack speed on here as well. Not to mention, I can get plus two to my max cold res by using the Eldritch Implicits. You have to use Orbs of Conflict. You actually have to win your Orbs of Conflict to go up to Exquisite on the Searing Exarch that gives us plus two max cold res. And that's how we can hit 90%. Not to mention getting a little bit of 10% spell suppression right there. And the plus two level of socketed AoE gems allows me to level up my purity of ice, my determination, and my discipline even higher. So I vastly, vastly prefer these gloves over the hands of the High Templar. If you find cheap like despair on hit and you know spell and attack crit, 
Hands of the High Templar. Absolutely, they're very, very good. But the quality of life that you get and the joy, I don't know. I will always prefer to craft my own gear over just, you know, buying some unique if I can. I really love these gloves and it allows me to fix my attack speed and hit exactly 10.1 attacks per second. Just a couple more things I thought of I wanted to add in <laughs> to, as if this video isn't long enough. Common thing that people do ask is what map mods to avoid. Good news is we can technically run literally every map mod in the game. There's a lot that are super annoying. This is a build that, you know, that we don't have to worry about reflect really. Do want to keep our level of vengeance as low as possible so we don't take that fizz reflect. It can hurt if you uh, level that thing up. So keep that level one. But other than that, nothing will kill us outright but there are things that are uncomfortable. Minus non-curse aura effect, that's just not good for us. We are very reliant on a lot of auras on this build, especially our discipline and determination. We don't want those being dinged, so I usually roll over that one. Uh, monsters have spell suppression. That's just flat, less damage done, basically, the whole map. I usually roll over that one. Little typo there. Less chance to block and less armor. We are a block and armor-based build. That is actually a hybrid mod on the maps, so it's a pain in the butt. I always roll over that if I can. And the combination of max res and alley weakness, since we have 90 max res, you know, just getting like minus nine on the map is not a big deal. We'll still have 81 max res above normal. That with alley weakness, especially, I'm not super over alley weakness capped on, on my setup right now. And that can just get it into the uncomfortable territory where I just usually roll over it. So those are annoying, but they don't just like hard brick the build for us. In addition to that, yeah, like hex proof, you know, we do way less damage. You know, why not just roll over them, scour elk again, try to hit something good. The ones that I hard avoid though, since we are cast on crit, we are based around cooldown recovery rate, less cooldown recovery rate. That's just a straight 40% less damage when you hit that or more if you have the uh, increased effect of map mods. So that was just a hard rollover for me. Combination of temp chains and chilled ground. You can go for less effective curse on a flash suffix. You can get chill immunity as a prefix on your boots, which is actually something I want to go for. So you can do that. But right now, it's just so slow. It's like it makes the map take as long as running two maps. So why not just roll over it? Cannot regen like I can sub in a mana flask for that and do it. We don't rely on regen at all for our energy shield. So it doesn't hurt our, our defense there. I can toss in a mana flask, just replace my, my dying sun and run the map like that. You know, if I corrupt my map and I hit it, I can run it. But that's just another one where why even do it? Just, you know, scour an elk and, and hit something better. So those are the map mods that I hard avoid. All right. And I figured it would be useful to at least have some sort of a gameplay display <laughs> in this video. Briefly go over this. Uh, we are using precision, determination, discipline, zealotry, peer device, defiance banner, and tempest shield. Uh, so that's why we are going for as much reservation efficiency as possible. We need ashes of the stars. We need everything. It allows us to just combine all of that together to have a very, very strong build. Uh, we are keeping the precision at level one. The reason why I have precision is, as I said earlier, it's just for the watcher's eye to gain flash charges. And then, yeah, basically the play style is just whirling blades and flame dashing around, hitting cyclone through packs of monsters, killing them, picking up the loot. I find whirling blades basically necessary for really good quality of life. You can drop it if you want to, and then kind of have a little bit more flexibility with your gems. Um, as you can see, Tempest Shield will just kill the monsters <laughs> on its own. Uh, we are scaling so much damage, so much crit chance and crit multi, that even elemental damage can kill packs of monsters. <laughs> just like that, it's kind of funny. There is one little mechanical thing that is good to know, is you can press Withering Step, and it will stay active as long as you're still holding down Cyclone. So press Cyclone, do Withering Step, and then as long as you're holding it down, you will still keep your elusive and your wither stacks and on in the AOE. So that's a good way that you can just increase your damage, quality of life, and defense as you're going around. You, know, you also go faster, right? The other two things is I have Molten Shell on left click. Unfortunately, I have to have Molten Shell on left click. I have no room for cast on damage taken. I would rather it be on cast on damage taken, but that's just, uh, I have no room for it. Uh, in addition to that, Ball Molten Shell, it's one of the best, like, I'm going to take a big hit or there's a big pack of monsters. I want to live through it. It's one of the best buttons in the game for that. In addition, I evolve discipline if I get a big bleed or an ignite or anything. You know, if I don't have uh, anti ailment set up for that, it's really, really good. Or if there's just a bunch of degens on the ground, right? Like fighting Uber Cirrus or something. And then, yeah, the play style is basically just whirling blades, flame, flame dash once in a while, kind of just cyclone through the monsters. You know, it's not the giga fastest thing, like bow builds with head under and all that will be faster, but we are just so tanky so smoothly comfortable like consistent as we're going through the map that it's like it's really really hard to overstate how good this build really is for just like 
how fun it is to play, how fast it is, how defensive it is. Knowing that you can go into the game and basically take on take on the world. There, there's very little content in the game that you just you can't do. There's like very close to nothing. You know, besides doing like a you know five way carry or something. Uh, and then yeah, we'll just go straight to the uh, to the map boss here, T16 map boss, just to show how quick the uh, <laughs> the damage is. I'll even hit it with a sentinel to juice him up a little bit here. So I'm gonna hit the where is he? Hit the map boss with a sentinel. I'm going to press cyclone and then whirling. Uh, and then Withering Step, and then, well, he's dead before I can finish my sentence. Uh, yeah, that's just the quality of the build. Uh, you know, that was a, a juiced up T16 guy, and there's not much more to say, right? Like, you're not, my energy shield basically doesn't go down. It's going to constantly be bopping back up to full as I take hits, and the replenish from the Aegis Aurora is happening. I can just hold Cyclone, lean back, and watch my character go forward and you know and kill things i don't have to do anything right there's no pressing of flasks there's no nothing <laughs> nearly an auto bomber at that point right that's the beat of the build you know if you weren't already convinced from me making an hour-long video i mean it's just as easy in wave 30 simulacrum 100 delirious triple beyond it cuts through everything like butter it is worth the currency to put into it Ooh, this is a long one. Thank you all for sticking through this. I wanted to be as thorough as possible. In terms of Giga Luxury upgrades that I find absolutely unnecessary and I probably won't do, uh, and alternatives, right? There's always alternatives and things that you can do, and I'm always going to advocate for people to customize builds for themselves. Power charge rings, right? Power charge synth implicit rings. They go for 50 to 80 to 100 exalts very, very easily. They're very expensive. Global defenses, Valregalia. At time of recording, you know, you can use a recombinator to transfer mods onto other bases. If you put 100% global defenses onto a Valregalia, or this is what I thought of last night, or a Saintly Chainmail, which can give us both really good energy shield and armor. I think people keep forgetting about the armor. I actually think that would be better. And then even better if you want to go super, super big boy is use another recombinator, put on Fractured Spell Suppression, and then you have, you know, mirror tier, insane body armor. Go for double damage on the synth dagger, you know, just straight up 10% more damage on the build. Go for perfect crit multi, small damage tools. That's the thing I kind of glossed over a little bit is I was able to go for different jewels here, right? My previous jewels were, you know, very resist and stat based. This one, I just went for energy shield and damage. And I crafted these really, really easily. Like, I think I just threw these into like reforge defense, reforge crit, and just hit decent stuff. You know, just be patient, right? D don't try to force crafts. Just have stuff that you're always crafting when you hit a harvest. You know, I hit these guys, which are really good. This is the level that this build is at. Each one of these jewels, that's not special, right? Little crit multi, little damage, little energy shield, gives me 2.03 million DPS <laughs> on, on this build, right? At the very high investment, like that's the value of going from like level 99 to 100, 2 million DPS each level. That's why I really strongly advocate be prepared, plan to like level up at least to 98. I, I would not do this build if you weren't going to go to at least 98. Um, it gets that much value. You could go for double corrupting those crowns of the inward eye. You could hit plus one power charge and reduce mana reservation efficiency, something crazy like that. You can always go for those big, big double corrupts. You can max out your crit without the diamond flask. There's a couple places where I haven't maxed my crit. I could go for a crit suffix on one of my flasks. I'm actually significantly over my crit chance when I have my power charges. That would allow me to swap my diamond flask with something like a sapphire or topaz flask or even a basalt flask, depending on you know what kind of tanky I want to go for, which is really good quality life. Or even a quartz flask if I just wanted some spell suppression and phasing all the time. An alternative is you can go for forbidden jewels to get profane bloom. Now, the cool thing is we don't need the profane bloom jewels, right? We actually have a lot of, of tail nodes here on the tree, so we can get forbidden power jewels or malediction jewels. I think withering presence is the cheapest. Last I looked, it was between 10 and 15x to get both jewels. So we can drop withering presence and get profane bloom. I didn't find that worth the effort. So if we take a look here, right? Each one of these jewels is giving me 2 million DPS. Let's do, you know, do a little math here. Each jewel here is giving me 2 million DPS. So that's 4 million DPS combined if I drop those jewels. Not to mention that each one of these jewels is 133 energy shield. So I'd lose 260 energy shield if I lost both of these jewels and a combined 4 million DPS. Dropping Withering Presence, I lose 5.9 million DPS. Yeah, it's a little bit more, 4 million versus 6 million. But all I have to do is if I'm doing something like Delirium or a super juiced map where I just really want those pops, just unspec Withering Presence and use Profane Bloom temporarily, right? You're just better off gonna have more quality of life and less hassle 
just like use those regret orbs. They're not that expensive. I think going for forbidden jewels just to add in profane bloom, absolutely unnecessary. I am very, very happy with where I'm at with this build. Hopefully this answers all of the questions that are out there, or at least the vast majority of them. The mo if you go to Path of Exile builds right now on Reddit, every other post, literally every other post I looked this morning is, hey, can I get some help with Forbidden Right? Can I help? Can I get some help with Forbidden Right? And I understand, like this is a very desirable, awesome build, but hopefully the length of this video, uh, if, if you've made it this far, has made it clear just how much goes into it, all the different pieces, the complexity, but also hopefully the effort that I put into this makes it clear how much I believe in this build and how much I think you should give it a shot if you're willing to put in the work and the education and learn. And yeah, we're finished. Now I get to edit two hours of footage. Yes. I want to say, first of all, thank you to all of you guys and especially to my patrons for making this possible. This, this type of video is a ton of work. Can't say thank you enough for all the support from everybody. Also, we hit 30,000 subscribers yesterday. What better of a video to celebrate that than a build guide that I truly believe in, that I put a lot of work in. You guys motivate me every single day to do this. You guys are what make this possible and, and uh, give me something to wake up to do every day. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments below if there's anything else that I may not have answered. Definitely join the Discord and join the stream and hang out and ask questions and we can keep learning and having fun playing Path of Exile and all games and just enjoying life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna go edit all this footage and take a nap. Goodbye.